The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. But the purpose of the miracle was never the miracle. The purpose of the miracle was the miracle worker. And in a day and age in which people are often saying, oh, I need a miracle. Yeah, uh, yeah I, we all do. But I tell you what, we need a miracle worker. We need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Author Max Lucado dives into Jesus' miracles to find hope and respite for society's loneliness. Next on Life Today. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh and I'm here with Randy Robeson and we're so glad that you're joining us today. One of my favorite people on the planet is our guest today and I, I've noticed that any time that America has been in any sort of crisis, a whole nation looks for his voice. And so um, I just want to welcome Max Lucado to the show. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thanks to both of you. I hope you're staying healthy and safe. It's just an honor to have a few minutes to chat with you. Oh, thanks. Your books, Max, I mean, my, my bookshelf's full of them. My mother's bookshelf was full of them. And you always seem to write to the, the pertinent felt need. It's like you've got your finger on the pulse of the nation. So you have a book that's going to come out. Um, tell us why you wrote this book called You Are Never Alone. Yeah, you know, the... Uh, the Lord's providence on this one uh, is very evident because, of course, to, for a book to release this September, I had to have it finished, you know, last September or, or at least a few months ago, uh, way before we knew anything about COVID-19. Uh, but for many years, I have sensed that there's this gnawing, uh, uh, what is it, weight weight upon people, that they just feel by themselves, even when they're surrounded by a crowd or even when they're in a happy relationship with someone, there's this sense of loneliness, loneliness to them. And their faith is, is not really connecting to the degree that it's giving them that vital relationship that God uh, offers to us. Yeah. And so I, I've thought for many years as a pastor, how could we address this? What could we do? And so really this book uh, emerged uh, long before the, the pandemic, before we knew words like self-isolation and shelter in place and quarantine. Uh, but the pandemic only uh, highlighted a sense that we already fa felt, and that is loneliness is everywhere. I'm curious, Max, was there anything that you wrote in the book before the pandemic that you went back and thought, oh my goodness, this had to be from God because it, it reaches right to where some some people had been through, you know, the, all that we went through last spring. Is there anything that just yeah. jumped out at you? Yeah, thanks, Randy. You know, even the opening story, I relate a, a conversation that I had uh, some, uh, by now I think it's probably been over a year with a a, a lady at the hospital whose son was in ICU, who had been in a terrible car accident, who also battled op opioid addiction. She herself was going through a divorce. Uh, and so I went to check on her. And I mean, she just looked, she was just exhausted, just exhausted, utterly exhausted. And after she related all these struggles that she was facing, she said, you know what? It's just me and I ain't much. Hmm. And I, I came to understand that phrase, it's just me and I ain't much. Uh, that's, a, that's a bumper sticker description for the way many people feel. And again, we felt it uh, before the onslaught of the virus. But then you feel this triple whammy of uh, an attack against our globe, an attack against our physical selves, again, an attack against our pocketbooks. And you have a lot of people right now saying, oh, it's just me and I ain't much. I wonder, um, I love the fact that you've gone to John's gospel to give a path through the wilderness. What was it about John's gospel and the way he told Jesus' story that you felt this is, this is the way to go? What a great question, Sheila. 
And, you know, uh, you've done a lot of writing in your life, and you know that, that when you, uh, you collect your ideas, uh, it's as important what you exclude as it is what you include. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that ends up on the, on the cutting room floor, right? Because yeah. it, it, a, a, a good book, uh, we've come to see, is, is, is not just written, but it's edited. And so there we have John. Uh, disclosing his self-editorial ability. We're there at the end of the gospel. He said, there were so many things that I saw that all the books in the world could not have contained them. And, and you know, maybe that's hyperbole, but then again, maybe it's not. I mean, he's been in the presence of God for three years. Who knows how many things he has seen? And he said, but I have selected these so that you might believe and in believing have life in his name. And so he self-edited. He went through all that process and said, "Okay, I've, I can't, I can't write a book that's bigger, you know, <laughs> that that no library can contain. So I'm going to select, I don't know, eight or ten or twelve stories, miracles, signs, and I'm going to select the ones that are going to help people have life. And that's always intrigued me. And so I, I went into looking at these signs in the Gospel of John, asking the question." What is it about the water to wine story that gives me life? What is it about knowing how Jesus fed the 5,000 men plus women and children that can give us life? What is it about the way Jesus uh, walked out onto the stormy sea that, that, that can bring life, can, can help us deal with this sense of this gnawing sense of isolation and loneliness? And so I, I loved it. It was, a, it was a faith refresher for me to look at those stories in the Gospel of John from that perspective. Well, pick one of those that really spoke to you and answer that question, what is it about that story that we can relate to even today? Okay, just one of them, Randy. That's not fair. <laughs> one at a time. That's not fair. One at a time. <laughs> well, you know, I would start with what is actually, I think, the least dramatic uh, most uh, pedestrian of them all, and that's turning water into wine. H had had I been in charge of the miracles that Jesus were was going to perform on earth, I don't think that I would have started with water into wine. I would have done something with a little more razzle dazzle. I would have done something with. A, I would have gone straight to a you know raising Lazarus from the dead or feeding thousands and thousands of people. But turning water into wine, I mean, it's just so simple. And yet that in itself is one of the reasons that it deserves to be in the gospel. Because most of our struggles are, we, we do have major struggles. Nobody's ever going to doubt that. But also we need to know that we serve a God who cares that we, I don't know, get the tasks done today on time, that that. When we plan the wedding, there's going to be guests show up. That, that if we commit a social snafu, he's going to hear our prayer. That it's not just the heavy duty, uh, heavyweight prayer concerns. It's the day-to-day -day needs of being a mom, of being a grandpa, of being a worker, you, you, you know, that, that he wants to hear from. And so when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to him and said, we got a problem, they're out of wine, I know all the angels rolled their eyes and said, hey, <laughs> that's, that's minor league stuff for Jesus. But Jesus said, no, you know what? If it matters to you, it matters to me. And that tells me that what matters to me matters to God. And I think that's so that what matters to God will eventually matter to me. You know, I was wondering, Max, a lot of people, I'd, I've even said it myself when I was younger, if I could just see a miracle then it would yeah. be so much easier to believe. But you talk about um, not so much the miracle, but the miracle of the presence of God in your situation. Talk to us That's about the, that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's the miracle. You know, that if, I mean, for, for crying out loud, if, if Jesus wanted, if, if the gift of heaven were miracles from heaven, Jesus would have performed many, many more. He would have spent more time on earth uh, just going to every possible source, uh, gathering of humanity, levitating, uh, healing, 
uh, calling. There would not be a grave occupied. I mean, there was so much more that could have been done when it came to miracles. But the purpose of the miracle was never the miracle. The purpose of the miracle was the miracle worker to draw us into a relationship with him. And in a day and age in which people are often saying, oh, I need a miracle. Yeah, uh, yeah I, we all do. But I tell you what, we need a miracle worker. We need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we ever get to the point where we think that Jesus exists to do our beck and call, where he is our butler, where anytime we call, if we have the right level of faith or the right type of prayer, then he's going to do what we say, then we've missed the point. Yeah. It's interesting to me that all the miracles are different. All the miracles are different. I mean, nobody could rub the genie bottle in the right way and expect a miracle co to happen. At one time, Jesus is healing with mud. Another time, Jesus is healing with the declaration. A t so one time, sometimes Jesus is all by himself and walking on the water. Another time, he's telling the disciples to pass out the bread where there was no bread. So it's it's a all shades of application. The key is not finding a particular recipe or formula. The key is connecting with Christ, believing with him, because the greatest miracle is when we're finally face to face with him. All these between now and then, they're just small time stuff uh, intended to strengthen our faith until we get home. If I remember correctly, Max, uh, I think it's in the book of John that tells the story of when Jesus crossed uh, whatever sea it was, I don't recall. But when he arrived on the other side, the people said, ah, oh, Jesus, come do a miracle, come do a miracle. All they wanted was the miracle, and he didn't yeah. do anything, turn around and left. Do well, you think, he, go ahead. Yeah, no doubt, Randy, no doubt. Even then, or especially then, they were fascinated by the miracle itself fascinated by the miracle itself. In fact, in the second miracle in the Gospel of John, when Jesus heals the son of a, an official uh, who had traveled from uh, Capernaum to Cana, uh, when the man came and pleaded for Jesus to come back, or pleaded for Jesus to heal the man's son, uh, Jesus, before he even responded, said, are you not going to believe unless you see a sign? Mm -hmm. I don't know why he said that. We're not told exactly why he said that, but I think he just knows human nature. Of course he knows human nature. Maybe he saw something in the face of the people. Maybe a crowd of people had gathered because they had heard of the water to wine miracle. And so they said, oh boy, we get to see another miracle. And maybe that disheartened him. And he said, are you not going to believe unless you have a sign? So Jesus never wants our faith to be contingent upon his performance. The ultimate miracle is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Outside of the empty tomb, uh, there is no more miracle needed. Now, we are surrounded by miracles. Each one of us have enjoyed elaborate, dramatic, and powerful answers to prayer. But if we ever think that our faith is contingent upon Jesus doing what I want in the way I want it, then he's going to look at us and say, you mean... You're not going to believe unless I give you a sign. Yeah. And, you know, that, that story, this may be where you're going, but that, that story on, the, on that road where Jesus told the man that his son was healed, uh, he still had to walk home. He did. Not he really did. seeing it. And that's in your book. We got a Isn't sneak peek it? at your book. It is. And I yeah. thought, man, what a powerful truth. Just having to believe while on that lonely walk to see it. It's the longest walk. And some of your listeners right now, I'm confident, are somewhere between prayer offered and prayer answered. Mm -hmm. And and that's a long walk. That's a long walk. But what I when I get to heaven, I'm going to find that official, and I'm going to thank him. <laughs> because the scripture says he took Jesus at his word. Mm. He took Jesus at his word and believed. Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus says something, that's all we need. Now, Jesus has said, uh, that there will be tribulation and difficulties in this world, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. He said that. Yeah. He said that he is coming back and he's preparing a home for us. He said that. So we can just hear all the words that Jesus has said and believe them, believe them. Now, we haven't seen the answer to all of our prayers yet, and we won't till we get home. But that doesn't mean we can't head in the direction. I always say it this way. Walk in the direction of an answered prayer. 
That's good. Walk in the direction of an answered prayer. Just begin to behave like that prayer is going to be answered because in the right way at the right time, it will. Mm. Max, 2020 will be remembered as the year where the world was put on hold because of this COVID-19. Uh, this is maybe an unfair question, but what do you see God, what is God doing in the midst of this? Yeah, uh, we believe God is doing something, right? We do, we do. And what we're witnessing is absolutely unprecedented. Thomas Fry is a futurist based in Denver. Uh, the 75-year-old man who's made a career out of reading the tea leaves, so to speak, of society and the world. I don't know what kind of man he is when it comes to faith. Uh, but he said, this is the most significant event in the history of humanity. <laughs> now, I know that's a statement that makes us fall back on our heels. But think about his argument. Number one, it's global. I read that even the, the, the COVID virus has been found in the Amazon jungle among the tribes. I mean, there's no place you're safe from it. Number two, it's financial. It's, fin it's financial. And we're all feeling it, some more than others, some of your listeners severely. And then it's physical. Uh, it, it, it's, it just gets us at our health. And no matter what we do, no matter what we do, nobody is absolutely safe. Now, uh, whether it's been overblown or not, as a conversation for another time. But every person has is susceptible to the disease. And so what a great question, Sheila. What is God doing in what is potentially the most significant event in the history of humanity? Global, physical, emotional. I wouldn't even add that. I mean, think of all the loneliness and depression increase in hotline calls. So my hunch is he's preparing us for a revival. My hunch is he's pruning the church. He's causing us to not be so dependent upon buildings and personalities. He's calling us to have a deeper personal relationship with himself. He's separating us from our diversions and our entertainments. He's just separating us from them. I thought it was interesting that this thing really got our attention when it caused cruise ships to be in trouble. I mean, for crying out loud, you know. <laughs> uh, so I think I think that's part of it. I think he's just getting our attention. He's preparing us for something. It's out of my pay grade <laughs> to say, is he preparing us for the end times? I know we're in the end times, but is he preparing us for his return? I sure, boy, sure. Well, let, let me ask. Happening. Let, let me ask it this way, because revival, I know, has been the prayer of many for generations now. How do we walk towards that prayer? Well, Jesus said that uh, the world will know that he is who he is when we are one, when we come together. Mm -hmm. And so I think ministries like, like yours mm -hmm. are absolutely essential in this day and age to continue to unite the church. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've come a long way. You know, Randy, you and I are old enough to remember when denominations existed to argue with each other. Yeah. And uh, we're not doing so much of that anymore. For that, we can be very, very grateful. But we are really in this situation now where we're seeing there's just one church. There's just one church. And, and, if, and if you believe in God as your Father and Jesus as your Savior and your Spirit as your, and the Spirit as your power, then we're in the same family. We're in the same family. Yeah. So I think well, let's continue to unify our hearts together. And just it, it, revival is a supernatural work of God. We can't orchestrate it or fabricate it, but we can sure ask for it. And yeah. so that'd be the second thing. Yeah. We, you, we, we come together as a family. We, we, we put aside all differences and we begin to pray pray for revival. Mm. That's, that's so good. And you know what? I can tell you a, a way right now, Max, and I know you support us in this, that we have been bringing Christians together for, for many years now. And that is in our mission outreaches and reaching out. And, you know, it's kind of funny because you know, we look back in the spring and we, we look at all the things that we did as, as a nation and maybe as a world to save a few lives. But there's an ongoing crisis, a crisis of contaminated water that's taking lives every day. But we can come together. We can be one in Christ as the church, despite our various differences and maybe disagreements. We can come together as one and say, you know what? We'll hear the words of Jesus. We'll act on them. We will take water to the least of these. Will you watch this 
And then just pray and say, Lord, can I be a part of that? Watch this right now. So we're coming down here to the water source where these ladies have told us this is their only water source. This uh, sort of river that flows through next to their village here is the only place they can get water from. You can see just how contaminated this water is. You can see animals use the same water as what people do. People wash in this water. It's, it's incredibly dirty. Um, but this is the only water source. And I think you might be watching this as a mother and you're saying, how can those mothers give their children that water? I, I would never give my child water like that. Yeah, you wouldn't, unless that water was the only water that your child could have. It's not that they don't know. They know this water is not clean. They know it's not healthy for their children, but they come and they collect it every day. Arduous journey, carry those heavy buckets of water back to their children to give their children disease-filled water in the hopes that it will give them the hydration they need, but not take their lives. And yet all too often, that is exactly what happens. They get waterborne diseases, cholera, dysentery, things like that and it literally comes in and it steals away the lives of these young children. But it's so easy for us to change that. You see, if we bring Mission Water for Life to this village and we drill a water well, we've got drilling rigs in the area, we have the ability to put water wells in. What we can do is instantly change the condition in this village and save the lives of children that will be contracting waterborne diseases. Stop mothers from having to come down and take dirty, disease-filled water back to their families. We're here. We're able to do it, but not without you. You know, it's so much in the heart of Christ to save the one. But for us, we can save so many today. And Sheila, it's so easy. Oh, it absolutely is. And you know, just those images I mean, just watching those images, somehow that one of that water bottle filled with that dirty water just shocked me as I saw it, even though I've seen it actually in Africa on the ground. Because I think of, you know, my son comes home from college and I have water bottles like that, you know, because like he drinks a lot of water and they're just there for him just to pick one up and take. And to think that that's all that mother has to give that child is, is devastating. And I know the very fact that you are, you partner with us on this show, the very fact that you tune in every day, I know that you care. And sometimes it seems overwhelming, but this is so, so fixable. You know, all we have to do is determine that together we're going to do our part. I just can't imagine what it's like for a mother knowing what I'm about to give you could potentially kill you, but I have nothing else to give you. But I've seen what happens when a well is drilled and it is literally, Randy, life-changing. It is. A beautiful thing about it is that the water is there. God has provided, but there's a gap. The water can be, in, you know, anywhere from a, a few meters down to, to several meters down, but the water's there. God has provided for them, but he needs, I think he wants us to to bridge that gap between the water he's given and the people in need. How do we do that? It's very simple. Each well costs about $4,800 to drill. So when we, when we look at that, we break it down, we say, okay, $48 will provide water for a lifetime for 10 people. That's your part of the gap that you can bridge. You can help us draw that life-giving water out of the earth to give life to people. $144 will provide water for a lifetime for 30 people. If you can provide an entire well, do it. Please do it today or maybe partner with two, three, four other people and give a well. Here's the point. We are on this earth as God's representatives to give life to others. We do it in word. We do it in deed. And we do it by giving living water figuratively in Christ and literally through this Water for Life outreach. I pray you'll go to the phones or go online right now and join us in bridging that gap between life and death as we give water for life. 
dirty, disease-filled water. How desperate would a mother need to be to consider giving this contaminated substance to her child? For many mothers and their families living in extreme poverty, this is their only choice. With your help, they won't have to make this choice ever again. Mission Water for Life provides clean, disease-free water for thousands of children and their families, giving them a life free from the fear of death. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish the final 150 water wells this year. Your gift of $48 will help provide water for 10 people. $72 will provide for 15. $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. And a gift of $4,800 will help sponsor a complete well, serving up to 1,000 people. With your gift, we'll send you Today is a Good Day seasonal devotional set. Broken out into the four seasons of the year, this beautiful set features a daily scripture, inspirational thoughts, and a place for you to journal your own thoughts, prayers, and insights from God's Word. With your gift of $100 or more, request the leather-bound, life-giving Proverbs Journal, filled with wisdom and daily encouragement from Proverbs, including lined pages for your personal notes. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And you may request a Mother's Strength bronze sculpture. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Do go to the phones, go online, give the best gift you can, and know that when you join us in Water for Life, you are saving lives. And Sheila, we've got something special just today for anyone that will join us. Yeah, when Max's new book comes out in September, you can actually go on now to your favorite bookseller, pre-order the book, make sure you get your copy. Max, thank you so much for being with us here. We love you. Oh, I love you both. Thanks, and God bless you, and stay safe. See you next time on Life Today. I wish I could do more for Life Outreach International, but I'm saving for retirement. We have a plan that can help you do both. Contact Life Planning Services today. Before his recent death, Ravi Zacharias challenged us to let our light shine and penetrate the darkness of a world in chaos. Next week, Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.